get into some stuff. I've kind of had an idea recently. Sorry you can't see my face anymore. I don't have a, a webcam on this computer. But basically, so okay. I, after talking to Jeff or Bernie, I uh -huh. kind of got came to the conclusion that a lot of the disconnect between what hunters are seeing on the back end versus what the biologists are saying versus what the commission is doing. It all kind of gets jumbled through the commission. And a lot of the times from what he explained, there's a lot of not necessarily minorities, but loud individuals going to commission meetings and influencing the commission in a way that, that kind of causes an outcome. That's more of a trying to please a bunch of people. Um, but it kind of has detriment to what you guys as biologists are saying to the commission. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it's a complicated process. There's a, the, you know, there's definitely a, uh, you know, the commission basically takes input from the public and um, considers it seriously. And there's sort of that aspect and yes, yeah, some, topics are more controversial and have more noise and get a lot of people to come and testify. Mm -hmm. um, so the commission's always trying to kind of find that sweet spot where it seems that we're being kind of true to the biology, but also as much as we can kind of um, accommodating, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the, the concerns of the public. I mean, what's, what's difficult for the commission to always get a sense of is, you know, there are, there are orchestrated turnouts on certain yes. things. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's mm -hmm. kind of a, a good yeah. read on the general public or the general hunting public's view on something. So, so they have to kind of. My idea out. is I'm trying to create kind of a community organization where I get a lot of, a, a good portion of the hunting community in Washington to follow this. <clears throat> And I don't know if you think other biologists would be willing to ex like to come in and talk to me, but I think opening a dialogue between you and the public, like if I was able to record the conversation and, and this conversation and, and let people kind of get a more educated perspective that kind of maybe, maybe that's not their experience because they have an isolated view of, of their own like hunting experience and it, it, for whatever reason, it, it goes against what you guys are saying. But if you guys say in a way that that kind of educates the whole, the broader picture versus how this is affecting me as a hunter, it might make a more solid opinion. And if I can take something like that with more, more involved survey data, even though I may, me and a couple people might be at commission meetings, we have accurate data from a lot of people voting on kind of issues beforehand and then i can take that to the commission and and have them see it with with a backed perspective maybe a thousand people voted on something versus i don't know what the the survey data and how accurate or how many people are involved when the department puts them out but i think i was looking at a commission meeting review where um things involving district three elk were being submitted. It was kind of a plan, I think a couple years ago, I think it was a 2018 meeting and the sample size for the, the survey was, it was 30. And that seemed, is that, is that close to what people participate or, or is it actually higher? And for whatever reason, that was just a low turnout. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you're trying to So, we uh, every few years we have typically um, made an attempt to get a pretty good survey down of public opinion. When we do that, we don't do it ourselves. We hire a, a professional um, survey entity, and it you know that creates you know does all the random sampling and mm -hmm. you know basically tries to get a, a pretty good survey done because that's what they do mm -hmm. I mean, that's it's not a bunch of biologists or managers yeah. trying to do a, a survey it's, yeah I, that makes sense we do public opinion survey so um 
we haven't, I, I can't remember the last time we did one. It wasn't that long ago, it was a few years ago. And so there'll be a series of questions that people are asked and, um, and it's uh, typically not just for the hunting public, but um, anyway, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure what the, the thing with the sample size of 30 is exactly, oh. I don't recall that. Okay. But. So basically to, to kind of like make an example, when I was talking with Bernie, he said that for a while, District 3 biologists, as far as elk, have been trying to reduce antlerless harvest, um, but there's kind of been a few organizations and individuals that have, especially archery hunters, that have kind of held on to that over-the-counter antlerless harvest for the past few years, even though you guys have kind of been recommending against uh, more antlerless harvest. I don't know if that rings true with what, what you've seen, but if if people were explained how you guys allocate harvest and calf recruitment and kind of that whole system of where if we're taking out more than we're putting in, it's it's not going to allow her, allow herd growth to get back to numbers where calf recruitment's kind of better. If people could understand that and be exposed to that level of thinking, I think, one, you'd have people pushing back against the people with the loud mouths talking about, oh, we need this late archery hunt. There's plenty of elk out here. Maybe there, there's plenty of elk to hunt because there's still 8,200 elk in the Yakima herd, for example. People are still going to be able to shoot cows, but they may not understand that it's not going to ever, it's going to be difficult to get recruitment numbers and other metrics that, that promote stability and, and herd health. And if we forego something for a couple of years and get it back to a system where it's more, more stable, that opportunity is going to increase versus maintaining a low opportunity because so-and-so wants their opportunity this year. I don't know if you think that would be effective, but that's kind of an example of. Yeah. I mean, ideally that's, that would, that would be a good thing. I mean, obviously everybody tends to protect their stuff pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, whether that's fishing or hunting or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, when we have things happen, like happened a few years ago that put us kind of um, in a deficit, so mm -hmm. to speak, uh, with Blue Mountains, Yakima, and Kalakam elk, um, you know, there's, there's different ways to get back to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. um, the... the um, more you react appropriately, then the quicker you get back and the, you know, the, the less time you have in sort of a, um, a spot where you're kind of really impacting people's opportunity. Yeah. If you don't do that, it's going to be a slower uh, sort of rebuild. So to jump and back. If you're taking too much, uh, if you're taking too much from the reproductive segment, then, you know, you could potentially not get the rebuild at all. Yeah. But so, um, so could you kind of go back and first kind of let me know like what your background is, um, where you started, the things you've worked on, whether or not you hunt or not, that kind of, and then kind of go into the past five years and what's happened to the elk as far as your perspective, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Yeah. So I have been at this for more than 30 years. So I might education is I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Montana in wildlife biology. I have a master's degree from the University of Washington in wildlife science and I have a PhD from the University of Montana in fish and wildlife biology. Um, and I worked for the agency since 2001. Prior to that I worked for about 13 years as the big game biologist for the Yakima Nation and prior to that I worked um, down at Hanford, which is where I did my master's to rework on elk. Um, so my master's work and my PhD work were both on elk in different parts of the state that spent most of my 30 plus years as a research mm -hmm. biologist, mostly on elk. Um, the last five or so years I've been, uh, I took a job as a regional manager, which is what the job I have right now uh, out of the Yakima office, but uh, again, most, most of my career has been as a research guy. So, um, I'm also a associate editor for the journal wildlife management, been doing that for about almost 20 years now. So I manage reviews of scientific papers that are submitted on 
uh, mostly on elk, deer, uh, black bears, grizzly bears, Pensacola polar bear stuff, because I have a little bit of background in bears too. So um, anyway, so that's kind of my story. Um, I, in my research job for the state, I, I had a statewide research responsibility. So I personally led research projects on elk in the Blue Mountains, on elk in the Yakima herd, and elk in the Clockham herd, and elk in the Nooksack herd, which is Northwest Washington, mm -hmm. on elk at Mount St. Helens. Um, and so I kind of covered the state pretty well in terms of the populations that I've worked on in different parts of the state I've worked on elk. So anyway, um, the current scenario or the current situation with um, kind of us not being where we want to be with all three of the big Eastern Washington herds seems to date back to the summer of 2015 was kind of, we think the or, or origin. And that was the summer that we had a really epic drought. So that was the summer that 200,000 um, sockeye salmon passed Bonneville Dam and not a single one of them got to the Dallas Dam. They all died in between the two dams from over uh, from, from water temperatures that sort of facilitated uh, some disease issues that um, they're usually fairly robust to, but and under those water temperature conditions, they weren't. And so they all died and pretty much wiped out the sockeye run. That was the same summer that we had um, a bunch of large sturgeon washing up on shore um, between the Tri-Cities and Bonneville that also seemed to be uh, related to uh, the water temperatures um, in, in that severe drought summer. So what happened with uh, deer and elk is that, you know, those kinds of conditions don't favor good forage production um, that animals can kind of begin to use in the late summer and, and early fall. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have some pretty good data that suggests that's a pretty key component to first year calf survival and getting through that first uh, winter. Um, and so we came out of that summer and went through the winter, which was also for Eastern Washington, was a kind of a winter with a prolonged low elevation snowpack. Um, couple things happened that were really notable. Um, at the end of the winter, as we came into spring, we started getting reports from people who were venturing out to recreate that they were finding dead elk carcasses. Um, and we're kind of wondering what that was about. Actually, and we did our, our helicopter surveys of those herds and we also started seeing elk carcasses. Mm -hmm. I, My I was, experience. I was out that year um, in the Yakima area and I remember finding quite a few cows. Um, I don't think I found any bulls that had died, but I had found quite a few cow carcasses <clears throat> hiking in, in that area that winter. So Yeah, and so what's unusual is that, in, you know, again, I've studied elk and done research on them for 30 years. Elk are usually pretty robust to severe winters, deer or not. Deer mm -hmm. take it in the shorts if you have a hard winter pretty commonly. Mm -hmm. But elk just have normally seemed to tough it out through those same winters that kill large numbers of deer. This time, that was not what happened. There was pretty good elk mortality. Um, and so it, it seemed like it was not just the bad winter conditions, but it was that um, it was that perfect storm of a, a really severe um, summer forage growing season and then followed by um, a hard winter. Mm -hmm. It was also the year, interestingly, is that we had this um, really major problem on I-90 between Vantage and Ellensburg, where about 70 elk were killed uh, by vehicle collisions. Mm -hmm. That's multiple times more than is typical. Mm -hmm. And almost all of those collisions were of elk that were being hit on the westbound lanes. So they were elk that were coming from the Clockham side, uh, apparently not going any further than the median and then going back. And that they weren't getting hit in the, the next set of lanes closer to, to the firing center, just in the westbound lanes. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen photos from that middle of that winter and it just so happens that about the only forage that stuck up above the snowpack was in the median. Oh, if you looked at the, if you looked at photos, 
both sides of the freeway were completely white with snowpack. Um, but in the in the median, there was a whole bunch of browse. There was a whole bunch of willows and gotcha. uh, um, great basin wild rye and things like that that were kind of available uh, above the snowpack. And it was the only place in, in those photos that I saw was like that. And it looked like what was going on as elk were trying to get into the median to feed mm -hmm. um, and then sort of coming back out of there. And gotcha. After that, after that winter, so everybody got, that got a lot of attention. Um, it actually led to a piece of legislation that came out of the legislature. Um, interestingly, the very next winter, after a more normal summer, the vehicle collision thing went right back to sort of what normal baseline looked like. Mm -hmm. So it was like this one blip um, and it all seemed to re relate to the, the likelihood that, that the elk had come off the summer range with lower fat reserves than normal. Mm -hmm. And that's an elk strategy to get through winter. They don't eat their way through winter. They always lose weight. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that they survive is they come in with enough fat stores that between burning the fat stores and getting a little bit of forage that they can in the winter, which is less than in the summer, obviously, they make it. Um, this winter, they came into that one the winter the winter of 2015-16 uh, in probably much lower than average condition and we had both mortality and we also had kind of unusual behavior on elk really trying to find something to eat. Mm -hmm. and, and harvest at the time was pretty high between both uh, non-tribal and, and tribal hunters, correct? The what? The, the harvest. Um, For, yeah, I mean, the regulations were pretty much the same in the fall of 2015. I mean, nobody knew this was coming. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think the initially the harvest continued pretty normal. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't know what tribal harvest is. It's not reported. Mm -hmm. Besides, um, besides the here, muckle shoots, correct? The muckle shoots report, but, uh, the other, so like the, uh, the Yakima tribe, which is the you know, the, the major mm. uh, tribal entity over here, mm. or I mean, most of this country that we're talking about, except yes. for the blues is in the Yakima seeded area. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't collect harvest data. They don't mm -hmm. report it to themselves and they don't report it to us. So, so we don't know what that is exactly, but. So you said you worked for them, correct? Right. Is there a reason why they, they don't collect it? Is there, is there a, uh an understanding you have that you're willing to speak on of why they don't report harvest and, and what that um, reasoning is. I know a lot of people are interested in that question from what I've yeah. gathered, but I, I mean, I think the, the most fundamental issue is that they just, they consider hunting a really cultural, traditional activity. They don't consider it recreation. They don't consider mm -hmm. it sport. And you know, it's, it, it has pretty strong ties to kind of even their, um, their religion so for I, I think for a lot of tribal members asking them to report on hunting is a little bit like asking people to report on how many times they pray <laughs> you know I, I mean it's just a sort of a really personal fundamental thing that um they don't think we the rest of the world needs to know um mm -hmm. and they don't think it's uh at a magnitude that is problematic so mm -hmm. Um, they just, they just don't do it. I see. Okay. They don't even do it on reservations. So yeah. 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 Um, and I, and I know that a lot of people have strong feelings mm -hmm. about that and, um, I understand that. Um, but it's, you know, it's, there's a whole bunch of court decisions mm -hmm. all the way to the Supreme court that basically make it so that that's, yep. that's what they can do. Mm-hmm. And I, I, that's why I'm trying to get people to focus on what we can do as hunters versus always pointing the finger at other external factors that are maybe more difficult to influence. And I, I don't think that means we shouldn't keep the dialogue open with the importance and how, how beneficial it may be to get harvest data from them. I don't, I don't know if that will change in the future, but I think as long as we can be respectful of, of their, their rights and, and have, Kind of that open dialogue of hey like we could we could use this for for beneficial means so all of us can benefit not just not just us you know so right um, um 
Yeah, we. I mean, we have we have a good relationship with the tribe at a technical level. We, mm. you know, our biologists, we collaborate, talk, and it, you know, it goes well. Mm -hmm. um, the job I had for the tribe was pretty much purely a research job. Gotcha. Um, so I didn't get caught up too much in the politics of yeah. that. But um, anyway. so before we go further, are you a hunter? I think a lot of people would be interested to know if you are. I, I have hunted in the past. I don't really hunt that much now. Mm -hmm. um, but I have in the past. Okay, interesting. Um, so I guess when I first contacted you, I was a little, I think I was skeptical like most people are when approaching the, the department. There's kind of a, a, a below average opinion, I think, of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife from the perspective of hunters. And I don't know where it comes from, but I think one of, like I, I mentioned the issue of, of how decisions get made can be influential because a lot of people see these see these decisions being made and they don't understand the full backstory of one you as biologists are recommending this and then the commission has to also listen to the public and maybe some a certain organization or individual had a loud enough voice to influence it to the point where out comes this decision where people are like why the hell are they doing that and I think, um, I don't know, like, when I talked to Bernie, he he was very supportive of what, what hunters want. When he was telling me, if you, if hunters want to manage District 3 in a over-the-counter three-point minimum, we'll manage it for that. If hunters want a draw-only system, we can manage it for that. And I... What's your outlook as biologists towards hunters and, and the importance of hunting and move like I would like to, to hear your opinions on how those management techniques would what the outcomes could look like with those changes in management and um, just yeah just if you could touch on those. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously hunt, hunters and fishermen are kind of the original constituency for pretty much all, uh, game management agencies. And it's the same for us. Kind of that's, those are the folks that, um, uh, have provided a lot of the funding, both through license sales and, and Pittman Robertson, mm -hmm. uh, excise tax dollars. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we consider them our sort of our original customers. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the world is getting broader now and more mm -hmm. people are interested than just hunters in what we do. And, um, and we hear from folks that aren't just hunters and fishermen, but mm -hmm. um, you know, those are obviously those are the folks that brought us to the dance. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so we do, we do try to listen to the hunting and fishing public. We do try to um, use that input to make management decisions that are prudent. We don't mm -hmm. just, it's not just a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I probably don't see it quite the same way as Bernie does in terms mm -hmm. of, well, we can do whatever that mm -hmm. the hunting and fishing public wants. Um, you know, there's, there's, enough we, we know enough about sort of what some outcomes would be um uh you know to know what kind of seems like a good management approach and what mm -hmm. is proven to be problematic in the past and probably would continue to be so so, so speak to, speak to that over the counter like if you moved it to over the counter three point minimum you'd be protecting spikes, which didn't happen prior to 1989 and 1994, depending on which herd you're talking about. And, right. and right. also when Bernie was talking to me, he said a lot of the data originally used in that management decision, according to the Starkey project, which was talking about um, elk uh, conception rates. He said wow. more recent data has led him and other people to believe in the scientific community that conception rates and, and pregnancy rates in cows are more due to, to feed availability and, and, and quality than it is with bull, bull to cow ratios, bull age class, other things that kind of were, were pointed to in the early 
90s and or late 80s and early 90s. Can you talk to about that a little bit? Uh, sure. So yeah, I, bull cow ratios um, are are probably not a strong driver of pregnancy rates. So pregnancy rates in Rocky Mountain elk are typically really high, no matter where you go. I mean, they're going to be 90% or a little bit better than that. Um, it's not the same for Roosevelt's. Roosevelt's are less productive. Um, they tend to have lower pregnancy rates. So getting cows pregnant um, can be done, whether you have old bulls or young bulls. What what you see with you when you have um, a large proportion of the breeding done by really young bulls is, yeah, you get you um, you tend to get later conceptions. You get a lot of more cows that don't get bred on their first estrus. They get bred on subsequent estruses, and they'll recycle numerous times. Um, there's there's data from the data from Starkey was a pretty well controlled uh, multi year experiment to look at <clears throat> breeding dates or conception dates uh, by age class of the primary bulls doing the breeding. And, and they did two, actually two studies. Um, and both found that when breeding was by very young bulls, <clears throat> the mean data conception was later than when you had um, older bulls. Okay. Basically, I think the oldest and, cohort they had was about five. And and what what percentage of age class would you have to see for that to happen? Like what, what percentage of year and a half old bulls would ha would be the breeding age? Like if, if you could say this is our bull population, if whatever per percentage is year and a half old bulls, at what percentage does that revert back to more early mean breeding times or conception? Yeah. Times? I don't, I don't know that we, you know, that there's any, research that's been designed sort of around quantifying that okay. um you know and but you, you would expect that if if uh if yearling bulls and two-year bulls are able to hold harems then there's probably not okay uh, an so, abundance of older bulls otherwise they didn't get, get kicked out so it'd be an observ um, observ observability right. so the other kind of data that is not from starkey but is from a lot of places and we have some pretty good data on this from the blue mountains yakima and clockham is that um, back in the any bull general season days when we would uh, collect reproductive tracts from cow elk that were killed during hunts and flush them, get the fetuses out, uh, and use the size of the fetus to backdate the conception dates. So what we found is that we had these really noticeable bimodal um, peaks in conception dates. So basically you had some in late September, and then you had a, another peak that was almost the same um, that was uh, about a month later. It was going to be late October, beginning of November. And those are clearly cows that didn't get bred the first time. Mm recycled, came back into estrus in late October and were subsequently bred. So Interesting. that's, that's kind of a different, um, it's a different way of looking at the same problem. So, so, the, so you know, the Starkey experiment plus the conception date data from reproductive tracts uh -huh. both suggest that, uh, and when we changed the regulations for that same date was collected and that bimodal peak disappeared and you gotcha. went back to a peak that's, um, mostly first estrus conceptions. And the reason why that's important is because it, if you, if you miss a first estrus conception and you're a month later, well, then the calf's born a month later. Mm -hmm. It has one last month question. to grow that first year to get mm -hmm. ready to enter winter. So. so it, so having that bimodal peak would affect late or would, would affect calf recruitment, I'm guessing. Right. So you're, yeah. And so kind of going back to Richard's question, it's not, it's not an issue about pregnancy rates. So mm -hmm. cows will recycle, you know, a lot of them that are in good enough condition will get bred and, um, you know, they'll, they'll have a calf, but mm -hmm. the timing of those births will get 
sort of altered. And that potentially has implications for okay. overwinter calf survival the next year. So, um, so it's more, so it's, it's, not, it's kind of a, again, more... so I, that's not the, I wouldn't get too wrapped up on the question about pregnancy rates. Mm -hmm. It's not pregnancy rates per se. It's more about, um, kind of the optimal breeding ecology and getting calves kind of on the ground early gotcha. enough that they have maximum time to get big before winter. Gotcha. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean calf recruitment would, would go down year to year. It'd just be more vulnerable to more fluctuation in winter, like hard winters. Right. Yeah. No, okay. it's, you know, it somewhat dependent on, on, uh, winter severity, um, and you know, how fast they can grow during the summer, even if mm -hmm. they're born late. So it's, it's a, it's kind of fuzzy data mm -hmm. to try to deal with because it's, um, it's sort of a long-term phenomenon. Okay. Um, if, if, so when I was talking to Bernie, he said if they did implement something like that in district three, it would probably be over the counter for archery and then more, more, uh, generous tag allocation for rifle hunters. Um, if, if that system was implemented, what do you think the effects would be down the road just from your perspective? So, um, I mean, the evidence is pretty darn compelling, not just from Washington, but from lots of other places that if, if your hunting pressure is high enough, mm -hmm. um, you're going to kill, um, most animals the first year they're legal mm -hmm. or the next year. Okay. Um, and so we had, we do have high hunting pressure. I mean, we're a small state. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, a lot fewer elk than places like Montana and Colorado. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's, you know, there's, even though the hunting public is a small proportion of the overall, uh, population, it's still, it still represents a pretty, um, pretty major hunting pressure given the number of animals that mm -hmm. are available. So. Uh, when you have any bull, so any antlered bull is, uh, is available. If you look, I showed, I sent you that one graph from the Blue Mountains. It's mm -hmm. a really large sample size of hunter checked, uh, yep. elk, uh, prior to back, back when it was in any bull regulation and the harvest was still overwhelmingly yearling bulls. It was, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere between 70, almost 90%, um, mm -hmm. across years of what hunters were taking and it was even though they could take anything yeah. it was still these little guys because there just weren't very many older bulls on the landscape and it, could that also be the fact that that in rifle seasons which are the primary primary harvest of of bulls that the the spikes the fact that they tend to spend more time with cow groups that are more easily visible that they become more vulnerable because they're not older age class bulls that are kind of hiding and and post rut areas that are more difficult to get to. Well, they, they not only don't show up in the harvest, they didn't show up in the surveys either. Oh, so okay. Okay. we would go out and do helicopter surveys in the winter. Um, and they just weren't there. Just like we do now, mm -hmm. you just didn't see these older bulls. If you went out, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm old enough that I remember going out to Oak Creek with my kids, um, back in those days mm -hmm. and it was a sea of cows and calves and there would be a spattering of raghorn bulls, mm -hmm. very few, yep. um, standing around and people would be pointing at those raghorns and talking about how awesome the big bull was. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and they were four point, five point bulls. So, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't think that's the explanation. I mean, uh -huh. I think largely we eliminated the older age class mm -hmm. segment in the bull population when, uh, again, if, if hunting pressure is high enough, that's a predictable result. I, I guess um, my question more is if you protect that age class, much like Montana does with their brow tine restriction, do you think bull behavior changes enough to make them less vulnerable to the hunting pressure during those, those late season times? Cause, cause as an archery hunter, I I'm, I hunt with everything, but as an archery hunter, finding spikes during the rut is difficult because they, they tend to kind of be either 
dogging the herd, getting pushed out, being confused. It's kind of a, a weird time to be a spike from, from my observations and makes them more difficult to, to pattern and, and potentially hunt, which, I, which is, I think, why you see such a low success rate among archery hunters. But as even though the success rate is still fairly low for rifle hunters, I think that's due to pressure. I, do you, would you think that they're more vulnerable as they start moving towards winter ground and, and are able to rejoin those cow herds? Uh, I think all elk are more vulnerable to hunting as they start moving down. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the Yakima herd, there's a good chunk of that herd that's living in wilderness during the summer. Yeah. Um, people hunt that wilderness, but they don't hunt it like other places mm -hmm. outside the wilderness. Um, when you get a, an early winter, um, you know, we, we, we've had radio callers on elk for multiple years and we, you know, even the cow take, um, cow survival and cow vulnerability to hunting, uh, is higher in when you get early snow and you get movement down low mm -hmm. um, and outside of those kind of tougher places to hunt. So, mm -hmm. um, over the long haul, I mean, I still think if you have, you know, you're basically still with the kind of pressure we have, you're mm -hmm. in the long haul, most animals are going to get killed the first or second year that they're legal. Yeah. So, so in that case, it would be two and a half, three and a half and very few four and a half year old bulls. Right. So you would, you, yeah, you, if you went away, if you went in that direction, um, you would, you'd buy a little bit of lifespan for, for bulls, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be a lot. And yeah. you'd get, um, you'd have more, um, you know, small branch antlered bulls, mm -hmm. but you still would have, uh, pretty much a paucity of, you know, five, six, seven, anything older than that. Yeah. Your so, goals. so if my, my idea has been, and, and I want to say this, that as a hunter, I don't want to speak from the minority. I don't want to try to change something that most people don't want to change. So, so if most people want to keep the system the same and, and hunt spikes over the counter and, and have a draw system for bulls, I'm, I'm not going to try that hard to, to go against that. I don't, I, I don't know how I can get that data without making this conversation and getting people to, to input what they think. I guess what I was talking about previously, I want to first talk about it like with mainly management changes because I know you don't, you aren't in control of the draws and, and what the draw odds are and, and how they are affected by this. That's kind of an a issue. I don't know if you have as much opinion and, and understanding of how that works. Most of that occurs in Olympia, right? So yes. I, I don't, I don't do anything that makes the draw system go forward yep. and, okay. um, and I'm, you know, the license sale thing is yep. happens, but it's not something I deal with or work. Gotcha. Um, so that was just kind of like an explanation of how the system would work to kind of keep revenue the same as having people purchase their license separately and then apply and then purchase their tag if they draw in a draw only system, because if, if you did a draw only system, I think you would have to, cause like you said, other states with a fewer amount of elk have kind of migrated to, to that system, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, a lot of those states that are primarily draw only, I think we're kind of in between for our number of elk, including Roosevelt's are kind of in between their numbers in a state like Montana. And because we've had access to an over-the-counter system for so long it's difficult for one hunters to let that go um, and understand that maybe it's better for for sustainability that that we don't have the opportunity necessarily every year maybe maybe on the west side if you wanted to transition your efforts there that that could be the case but but it's not maybe not something that could support it, it could support it but for overall benefits it might be better to forego hunting elk every year in exchange for op more more consistent opportunity and more guaranteed opportunity in a draw system with better success rates and lower hunter hunting pressure to, com to compete with. I think those are the, the, the effects of something like a draw only system. Um, but mainly it would be if you did a draw only system, 
I'm guessing from a biological perspective, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to go, okay, we're currently over the counter spike harvest and draw permit, and then next year we're gonna make it draw only, but harvest the same amount of bulls. I think this you'd run into the same issue of yes, if those spikes if again, make it a draw only system but protect the spikes so the the regulation would be a three point minimum or brow tine regulation on the draw only permits so those spikes are still being protected if you did that you would run into kind of the same problems as an over-the-counter system where because they're more vulnerable or not necessarily more vulnerable but because that pressure is focused on legal animals you would kind of run into that same situation and and kind of the older old old age class bulls that are currently in the system would one get harvested or die of other causes and then you would have a kind of similar situation with like you said low age class and most of the harvest if you kept harvest the same in that year after that they become legal and so would it be one possible to implement a, like kind of a phase in system where you keep tag allocations low to let the age class kind of stratify and then as it as it kind of becomes more stratified then increase it to a capacity that's more consistent with years prior uh, again bar like understanding that that calf recruitment is back to normal numbers and the herds back to objective if not ab above objective if you were at those numbers and you could then harvest the same amount of bulls as you were and you allowed that age class to stratify and you weren't over harvesting bulls do you think you would still be able to get an older age class with without uh with with a draw only system that's that's still harvesting a a pretty good percentage of your of your overall recruitment um yeah so i i mean there's a lot there so i i think the way that you really seriously truncate your age structure and get back to uh, a bull population that's pretty much teenagers or so um not literally teenagers yes. but in elk years teenagers mm -hmm. <laughs> which is young bulls mm -hmm. is is with um kind of an unlimited uh, availability so either either a an any bull regulation or even a, uh, you know some version of like a three point or five point minimum mm -hmm. you're still gonna you're still gonna whack out pretty quickly mm -hmm. I, I believe your older age class bulls now with a draw system a permit system you you have the ability to control um, and manage survival rates which is really what is going to drive this mm -hmm. so it it would be possible with some sort of a primarily permit system um you you know there there's a bunch of math involved and there'd be some adaptive management but mm -hmm. um you you could in theory manage your uh you know your permit allocation to maintain survival rates that are not so low that you don't get some of those bulls still carrying over into those older age classes we've you know when we've done those public opinion surveys that i mentioned earlier mm -hmm. there's there's a fairly strong support for uh, permit mm -hmm. only kind of hunting um we've never gone there in washington mm -hmm. um you know part of it has just been trying to maintain as a value that you don't have to be lucky to hunt mm -hmm. you know that every year you get lucky you can hunt for a certain kind of animal but at least every year you can buy a license over the counter and mm -hmm. go hunting so mm -hmm. that that's something that we you know generally not um we haven't crossed that threshold i mean oregon you know most i think i think all, almost all of their eastern Yes. Oregon mule deer hunting is permit only, and I think most of their elk hunting is also. Besides rifle, I think they've got a little bit of general season for archers, maybe. But it's um, actually pretty generous. So I actually, as a military member, get over the counter uh, or resident prices for their tags. So last year was the first year okay. I hunted, but there it's basically a gen. If you're an archery hunter in Oregon, you have very generous over the counter opportunity, but for rifle, their their system is permit only. 
So right, and and they have from a standpoint, Oregon has much more Rocky Mountain elk than we do. Um, a, a, quite a bit more habitat on the east side than than Washington does. But at the same time, if you compare bull to cow ratios from like in Oregon compared to Montana or Idaho, they tend to be lower um, from what I've seen from looking at, at their statistics. They kind of hover in between that that four to basically 11 range in the e- eastern side of the, the state. And I think it's because they manage it for that any bull or any elk for archery and then any bull for, for the rifle. And the difference I think is for rifle hunters there one, they're under a preference system. So if you're looking to hunt a a unit that's not like a once in a lifetime Blue Mountains trophy unit, you're gonna draw within a certain period of time because they take 75% of the the of ta- uh, the applicants and, and give the top people with the top amount of points tags first. So, right. <clears throat> so unless like the Blues where you're giving out so few tags that that system kind of runs away. So for example, if you're an Oregon resident and you just started putting in this year in the blues, you're never going to catch up if it continues to be a preference system because so many tags are going to the top tag holders and there's so many applications in there. Unless you draw right. that 25% that's in a, a random, which is very low chance with the amount of applications, you're not going to draw something like that. But for, for rifle hunts in other units, it's, it's kind of a, a guarantee that you're going to draw the difference is they're they don't have like an early rifle rut tag usually um i think is is a difference um but right. for example our in comparison our system the way it's set up which is again things that you can't really talk to but things like reducing the amount of uh choices you have for like a late bull for the bull category you have four choices the the peaches ridge unit last year had 4400 applications for the 20 some tags normally it's in the hundreds um for that area and and that equates to even with a lot of points very very low draw odds for people even though it's because again the east west and the amount of hunters we have applying for district three and the blues i don't know what district it is it kind of it's not it from a perspective of a hunter doesn't focus the amount of hunters we have enough and people can kind of have their hand in every pot. So they can buy an east side rifle tag, put in for the blues and Kalakam for quality, put in for all of the, like four of the Yakima tags. If they don't draw either of those, they have an over the counter hunt opportunity and they kind of have their hands in every pot. So as that system is currently in place, it makes draw odds low and increasing tags alone would increase odds but I think there would have to be other changes made as well to focus people in order to improve odds to a point where you can guarantee someone a tag every... So it's, so like you said, it, the the idea is you don't want people to hunt if they're lucky. Um, but if, if tag allocations are high enough and hunters become more focused, I think there's a way to make it so it's more of a, a guarantee... For example, in Nevada, um, they only have 13,000 elk currently. They they have a seven-year waiting period, which is another way to focus hunters. Once you draw, you have to wait seven years to draw again. What that does, though, is it, it keeps so many people out of the application pool that have already drawn that usually you have pretty good odds. And it's it's most time you talk to hunters, it's, oh, when, my, when I was down there, for example, I, we were on an elk hunt that my buddy drew as a non-resident and hunters were like oh when my when my son or when my daughter or when my wife drew this tag it wasn't it wasn't a oh i'm the only one who's ever drawn this tag and and maybe in years more previous when application pools weren't as heavily utilized and the numbers weren't as high people could say that that were involved in that process 10 years ago but at the way it is now even though hunter numbers are decreasing the number of applicants, if you look at the draw tables, are people with one point, that number is growing every year, um, especially since you don't have a waiting period and you don't have anything to to kind of clear people out. That system's going to get worse before it gets better. And even if you increase the amount of tags available, 
that system might still not be able to to guarantee people who in, are involved in the draw process a tag. Um, but again, like you said, it's it's a controversial issue because you're taking away over the counter opportunities where someone maybe they only have two to three percent chance of of shooting a spike and and if you it doesn't equate this way but if you tell someone you have that that amount of odds that's basically one spike every 20 years if they if they follow the trend right that's kind of how the the numbers work out even though some hunters are going to be more successful and some people are going to be not successful at all if if that's the 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 opportunity you're giving then would would hunters rather have that opportunity one spike every 20 years or potentially if you if you're talking about two categories bull and quality and making the late rifle hunt even more uh more of a chance to draw potentially two two to three bull tags in a 20 year span and antlerless tags on top of that i don't know i think do you think there's a, a way to manage it if we focused hunters and, and like you said, transitioned it to a point where bull numbers are high enough that we're, and we're harvesting not at a super, I'm not saying manage this at a, so in Nevada, for example, they, they harvest about 20 to, 20 to 25% of their bull population every year. In, in turn, that transit, that number means that they have a statewide average of 46 bulls to 100 cows across their herds and a hunter success rate of about 45 percent for the tags that are given out they also have older age class bulls and their trophy potential is through the roof if you draw a tag there i'm not saying you have to manage it for trophy quality but if you could manage it for one some bulls that are escaping to that above seven year old age class do you think it would be you'd be able to allocate enough tags per hunter success to if the uh, if if hunters were spread out in the draws and their awaiting per period for example was implemented do you think you would be able to have a high enough harvest to kind of meet opportunity and and trophy people who are looking for a more of a trophy hunt kind of meet that in the middle as a manager so that's kind of a really complicated question but and there's a lot yeah of i mean yeah um i mean i think there's a lot of creative space to figure out um you know some other alternatives mm -hmm. short of you know i mean the only thing i'm pretty darn certain of is, is if you didn't have a system to um sort of have a way to manage overall bull mortality, you're going to end up with almost no old age class okay. bulls with the kind of pressure we have. Okay. That's not what I, that's not what it sounds like you're proposing. So no. you're proposing sort of, um, you know, a permit system that would provide you the mechanism to still, um, uh, kind of manage up and down the bull survival rate you're getting, mm -hmm. uh, to meet your, your, objectives and then you know those objectives are broad like you're saying then you know there's some objectives that relate to opportunity uh, but there's also the objectives that you want your elk population to sort of look a certain way that as we have grown to understand the way elk populations work is probably beneficial mm -hmm. um for them for their ecology so um yeah i i you know i don't know exactly what it looked like um but uh yeah it, it it would not be it's not impossible to to do that um mm -hmm. you know under a permit system and still meet sort of those broad array of objectives mm -hmm. um because you do you do you do still have some mechanism to kind of cap what bull mortality mm -hmm. rates are going to be and um, if you have uh you know, open bull or if you have pretty much any you know bull that's older than than two or three is fair game then i think you'll lose the older age component with our kind of pressure gotcha um do you i know a lot of people have this question again we've kind of already talked about tribal harvest but do you guys have a, a 
Bernie made it sound like you guys, even though the Yakimas don't report, with the Muckleshoot reporting and kind of an estimate on on biologists' behalf, do you know what the number <clears throat> is, kind of the range of, of harvest for total tribal harvest from year to year? Do you guys have those numbers? Or um, So, I mean, the best way we, you know, the best information we actually have on kind of what its level of impact is, is when we go out and, you know, hang radios on a bunch of elk and follow them through time and see what happens to them. Mm -hmm. um, we've done that, you know, we've done that in almost every study that I participated in, even when that wasn't the primary goal. Mm -hmm. um, did I, I think I, did I send you that report from the Blue Mountains? I think I did. I believe so. I don't, no. Yeah. So, you know, and so that gives you a way whether any particular entity um, wants to tell you, you know, what their hunting effect was, you're going to measure it because mm -hmm. it's sort of, it's, it doesn't require human cooperation generally. It's just, you know, the radio is going to tell you when the animal's dead, you go try to assess why it died mm -hmm. and sort of you, you build up a data set. Yeah. Um, like that. So when we've done that, um, the the level of impact, uh, the number of radio and animals dying at the hands of tribal hunters, it's it's pretty darn small compared to the state licensed hunters. Okay. Um, and that's so and that... you know basically the way it works. You know, for the Acoma, for example, because it's the one I know the most. Um, you know, that, that hunting right only accrues to enrolled tribal members. Mm -hmm. So when I was working there, I think the tribal enrollment was a little more than 10,000 people. So mm -hmm. that includes all the elderly people, all mm -hmm. the babies and children. Mm -hmm. So the number of people that kind of had that hunting right availability to use pretty darn small number of people compared to what we put a field with a state licenses. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I've, I've never seen any evidence that suggests that, um, you know, the tribal harvest is kind of driving things or it's, mm -hmm. it's really impacting the ability to produce opportunity for, mm -hmm. for other, um, users like our hunters. Um, it's, you know, the way we deal with it, since we don't know what it is, it's just kind of, it's, it's noise. So mm -hmm. basically it's, it's sort of fits in just like predator mortality. Yep. Yep. Um, it's something that you don't know. It sort of, it's fingerprint shows up in the survey data. Mm -hmm. That's can all be accounted for by the known harvest. And so you just deal with it as, as best you can as, is somewhat of an unknown, but you know, again, you, you can kind of see the fingerprint of it. Yeah, and and with that being said, I I've kind of for people that have pointed the finger in because I've had discussions on forums and stuff about this. A lot of the time, it, it comes back to tribal harvest because people it's what people see that when when they see uh, a tribal member with a bull or two in the back of their truck and driving away that that's a big impact for for someone in a circumstantial experience with that being said i if you look back at when the numbers and and harvest data were were fairly like opportunity was fairly high with the current system um elk numbers were above objective and that that whole time period i've, I've told people predators and and tribal harvest wasn't gone then it was still it was still a factor then like it is a factor now but because it's still a factor and you you guys still have to factor that in it may in turn look like less opportunity for non-tribal hunters um in this situation that we're currently in compared to five to ten years ago so does that um, yeah i mean there's, there's the tribal controversy is one that you know hear often about mm -hmm. um there's a lot of it's a lot of there's a lot of emotion there's a lot of um kind of speculation um mm -hmm. i know when i worked for 
the actors. I mean, they're they're out living on the reservation too. <laughs> that are that are they are hunting. Yeah. And that population was growing the entire time I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and you know, they're what well, what we're really talking about in terms of the hunting, tribal hunting that would affect uh, non-tribal license holders is going to be off reservation mm-hmm. hunting and some proportion of the tribal hunting population does that but some of them hunt on the reservation primarily mm-hmm. too so um not you know not saying it's a trivial source of mortality but um i think it's a little overhyped generally okay or it being kind of a crisis that needs to be dealt with yeah i understand um so if you don't mind i have a number of questions people sent in that since I told people I was going to be talking to you, they kind of wanted your input in. You might not have a que- uh, answer to it, but I, I figured I'd ask. So um, one okay. actually comes from a buddy of mine. He's a bio too for the Kalispells for their fish, um, their fish projects over there. He works on cutthroat trout in the, the uh, Northeast section of Washington there. But he okay. said, what factors do you see limit public awareness of what your department does in terms of management? And what's your biggest challenge as a biologist? Um, so, I, you know, I don't think we're very good at telling our story. I think one of the things that we have still not figured out how to adapt to um, is the social media mm-hmm. uh, world. So in you know we, we've always had um kind of a value in wanting to hear from the public and get public input historically the way we did that is you set up a meeting and you put out an announcement and you showed up in some meeting room and you talked to whoever came well when we do that nowadays almost nobody comes mm-hmm. for most things so when we have, I mean, you'll see, we'll travel around the state during this three-year package cycle and hold public meetings, and they'll be most likely pretty sparsely attended. We'll probably mm-hmm. have more staff people at a lot of those meetings than we have uh, general public. Mm-hmm. Um, we generally get we get more response to those kinds of venues when people really think that. Um, so they've got critical skin in the game. They, yeah. They're something that they're afraid they're going to lose. Mm-hmm. But if you just tell people, hey, we're going to have a meeting about hunting and just see what your ideas are, that just doesn't, it's, in today's world, that's not a very good way to connect with people. Mm-hmm. So I think we're, we still have some learning to do in terms of how to best use um, kind of the evolving technology to fill that um that need to hear from people. Gotcha. So I think that's that's one of the challenges. I mean, it, you know, quite honestly, one of the other challenges we have is that everybody's an expert. So um, <laughs> uh, that's you know that's just kind of the nature of the game. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, as especially um, as information is more readily available, everyone wants to be able to back up their their side and and right. So. I'm trying. I'm trying to approach this. Um, I, I think initially I may have contacted you out of out of skepticism and and kind of trying to understand. I was I was more trying to understand the system, but I was I think I was a little frustrated. And and you were you did a really good job of of kind of just giving me what what you had. And and I think it's easier to talk in this capacity over over a, a meeting like this because it's you're able to. I don't know, just the personality of it. And I think that's why I'm trying to capture something like this so people can see it. So we can kind of open up that conversation and, and increase public awareness of, of what biologists do and, and kind of inform that, that section. So, um, second question would be, and like, like you said, you're not in Olympia, but someone was saying, what would the practicality of doing a by point buyback system where those who have applied for 25 years and not drawn if they no longer want to be involved in the system could raising tag or application prices allow the state to refund their unrewarded application dollars kind of uh, boy <laughs> not something i've ever thought about um i mean you know the the there, there has been talk before about um 
you know, is, is there other things you could do to make people that have a certain number of points accrued have an even better chance mm -hmm. uh, of drawing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that kind of concept has been around and we hear it come up once in a while and nobody's really come up with kind of an ideal version of that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really heard any conversation about kind of a point buyback approach. So I'm not, not sure what I would I, say to that. So I, I, I think I, I have informed opinion. Yeah, I responded to that person in, I think it's more effective to try to manage elk in, in a draw system for opportunity so those people draw rather than just letting them get so frustrated that they want their money back, especially in a system where as hunters we put into this system, we buy our tags, we buy our applications knowing that it's going to fund management like that. I think the disassociation is when people kind of feel like they're doing that, but they're, they're not getting any reward for their efforts, for their, their conservation dollars. And I think that's kind of where okay. that question comes from. But I think there's things to do before we start giving our money away, even when it's as limited as it is already trying to manage it differently. So pe those people have a chance, like you said, kicking around ideas where those people do end up drawing and they don't go their whole lives without ever drawing a, a quality or, or bull tag in an area they hunt. So yeah, no, I agree. I agree with you completely. I think, um, you know, whatever you can do to make the system work so that people are getting that opportunity that they're trying to, you know, buy and accrue points towards, that's, that's certainly much more preferable than people getting to the frustration level where they're mm -hmm. you know, wanting a refund kind yeah. of thing for their lifetime, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, I, you know, I look at the blog some and, you know, I know that there are a lot of people that just think the agency wants to sell licenses and it's all about the money. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't believe that for a minute. And mm -hmm. my experience, uh, here is not that, mm -hmm. um, I mean, yes, the, the money helps us manage these critters, but we want people to be able to, uh, have an opportunity to, to do the kind of recreation they mm -hmm. enjoy and want to do around wildlife. And it's not about just making money. So. Mm -hmm. And, and I, that's, I want to figure out where that, where that point is, where people are, are starting to get that opinion. Cause, cause if we can fix that and kind of build a more, a, a better, more positive image of, of what you guys do as biologists and managers, I think the more support you guys can get and the less people feel like they're, they're being attacked or they're, they're being held down, even though they've invested in something like that. I think improving that would have long-term effects versus just changing the system and, and some people benefiting because the, the fact of the matter is, is if we change a system in district three for, for elk hunting, that doesn't affect the people that like to hunt deer there. And it doesn't affect people who like to hunt deer across other states or not. Roosevelt elk or whatever. So keeping conversations open, I think is, is a way to talk about all issues in the state rather than just ones that affect us. So, um, so since you're recording this, I'm just going to just for a point of clarity, mm -hmm. um, because it's going to be sort of in this recording. So, um, so our, we manage the geography by region and by district. So, mm -hmm. um, it's not really district three when we're talking about Yakima oh, clock and it's region three. Okay. It's region district three. eight district. District eight. eight is actually Bernie's district. Okay. So, um, blue mountains is region one. District it's not three. district one because that's Northeast Washington. Yep. So anyway, it's Thank just you. so people are listening to this. I just don't want them to be confused about the district region thing. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure I've got that confused. Cause I've seen, I've seen both when I'm looking at, at harvest data, I know I, I click on, district eight for yeah you for can look it up by district or region yeah um but anyway so okay, thank you yakima clock and that's that's region three but district eight okay thank you um yep so i think we already answered this question they said why is the yakima herd down and why did they go away with general cow archery and and give out 350 special permit tax so i guess we since we already talked about why the herd's down could you speak to why they made the the archery season permit only. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, you know, once it was apparent what had happened after the summer of 15 and the winter of uh, 15, 16, and actually we had another hard winter the year after that, um, I mean, we, the permit hunts, we started cutting those back pretty dramatically mm -hmm. um, after that first winter um, because the archery season was not permit controlled. Um, you know, there was some talk about immediately kind of going to um, a, a permit approach for the archery too. Um, and as you know, there was a, quite a bit of pushback on that. Um, and to the point where there was, you know, the, the idea was floated that, well, what, what if it was a general season, but it was shorter than normal. Mm -hmm. So we tried two years of kind of a half general season archery, um, but we still end up, you know, as long as it was general season, we have no control over the number of cows that are going to get killed. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, we kind of know from, from other data that, uh, you know, most of the harvest in those general seasons occurs at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it, in some ways it, you know, you can cut it in half, but it doesn't necessarily mean you get half the harvest. It just means you shift <laughs> the beginning to a different point. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we were still, we still were, you know, and basically we were still trying to pay off our, our debt by using a different credit card, which just doesn't, you know, isn't a, isn't a good approach financially <laughs> and it isn't a good approach with, uh, um, managing hunting either. So gotcha. the, uh, the best way to again, make progress in a timely fashion towards getting us back to where, you know, what we sort of, most of us are, are used to for mm -hmm. the last 15 years was going to be to do something to ratchet back the or less elk mortality. Mm -hmm. And so the only way it seemed that we could do that was that everybody had to operate on a permit system for mm -hmm. those tags. And obviously if we didn't have any permits, we'd get there faster. Yeah. Um, if we got to weigh in on those permits for everybody, it, it would be a lot quicker to yeah. the point where we're back where we want to be. Mm -hmm. But that's hard on people. And so we were trying to find a more, a less draconian way to sort of still allow some uh, analysts more harvest, but to really try to keep it in, in bounds where we're still got a, you know, kind of a net increase each yeah. year and we're kind of moving in the right direction. So, so would it be fair to say if this, even under the permit system, say there's enough harvest on their permit system this year that you guys don't see a change and say calf recruitment still fairly low next year would it be likely that those permits drop in in years if you're not seeing that positive gain um i mean yeah i mean you know ultimately you're going to manipulate your permits when, to kind of reflect what you think is there as the harvestable surplus so mm -hmm. could it go down it could um you know calf recruitment that you mentioned is is a is a big one that mm -hmm. we have no control over. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but if we got some decent calf recruitment, then it's you know I think that would be not particularly likely that we would have to keep ratcheting it it down. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we have pretty good long term trend data on what success rates are going to be, and that's a key component of of kind of figuring out how many permits you're going to issue. Mm -hmm. Um, we obviously we don't issue the number of per, the number of permits we're issuing isn't the number of dead elk we want or mm -hmm. think we will get. Mm -hmm. It's you know it's more than than that because mm -hmm. we know what the success rate is going to be. So yeah. um, we're hopeful without some more curveballs being thrown at us by the weather mm -hmm. and with some at least decent calf recruitment that mm -hmm. um, you know that we should be moving in the right direction now. Sounds good. Um, so when I was talking to Bernie, one of the things he talked about was um, the the number of cats in the area that affect calving periods and that in a reduced number in the 8,000s that they've seen that predators have more of an effect on 
calving and calf recruitment uh, than when it's at a higher number. Um, so I guess this question kind of goes into that. What would it take to bring hound hunting back? And do you think that could benefit calf recruitment and numbers if it was successfully reinstated and, and harvest was more, more liberalized rather than under the quota system that it is now? Yeah, I mean, so we basically have no legal authority to bring back hound hunting. Neither mm -hmm. does the commission. So it's you know it's we have a hound hunting ban that was enacted by um, voter initiative, which is a legal way to change the law in Washington. Some mm -hmm. laws, um, the legislature could could change that, um, but then you know they also have to sort of understand that they're doing something that the public has already weighed in on previously and mm -hmm. said that they didn't want. So, you know, I think that's the dilemma, but the only way you're going to get hound hunting back, um, is, you know, as a, as a kind of a manage uh, a management tool that you could use for licensed general hunters. I mean, we still use hound hunting to chase, um, cats that have gotten themselves in trouble and remove them. Uh, we've always had that ability, mm -hmm. but uh, for, to get general sort of hound hunting back would require um, an act of the legislature. What about what about just an increase in the quota to the point where because because one thing Bernie also said was that in in this system without hounds, most of the cats that are, that are getting killed are usually juvenile males, and harvesting that portion of the population doesn't really affect the population that much. So would even an increase in the in the quota, which would be more changeable in the terms of it's not a legislative change, do you, do you, it, as far as I understand, how difficult would something like that be? Yeah, I mean, the, the agency has the legal authority to kind of manipulate harvest objectives um, that don't involve hound hunting. Mm -hmm. um, it's... Um, you know, definitely there's a fair number of juveniles that get taken with boot hunting, but it's not just juveniles. I mean, there, we, we have other, we have adult males sometimes taken, we have adult females taken, um, across the state and even in this region. So, um, you know, it's, it, if you've been following this, it's, you know, there's a, been some activity on this lately. There's a lot of controversy, um, the number of cougars in any particular area is not known with certainty. Mm -hmm. We, you know, there's a lot of research on cougar populations and they're, you know, they're not like deer populations. They're not going to build up sort of without limits. I mean, mm -hmm. cougar populations are always going to be partly regulated by just, um, social structure and social strife and, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every piece of ground has the same density of cougars mm -hmm. either. So, um, so that's, you know, right now we, you know, the commission made some slight modification to, um, the cougar harvest, uh, management approach that we have. Uh, it's, you know, I'm sure from a lot of people's perspective, it's not a big enough change, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, those kinds of changes are, are they're going to come through some of these processes like, um, uh, the three-year package or, uh, you know, we can we periodically rewrite the game management plan, mm -hmm. which is a big effort. And, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, um, you know, Washingtonians have a, a broad array of perspectives on mm -hmm. uh, predators and their management. So, yeah. um, but, but yes, short of, short of changes to hound hunting, there are other things that are kind of in the toolbox, mm -hmm. so to speak for managing cougars and in theory could be, that could change through time. I have a question. So do you, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but are, tribal members restricted to hunting off reservation with hounds like non-tribal members or, or or could a a yakima hunter who runs cougars come off reservation and hunt cougars in the 
uh, non reservation area. Yeah, I, I believe that's true. I believe so. You know, the way, you know, there's a lot of law about um, tribal hunting. There's not as much as there is about tribal fishing, but there's a fair amount anyway. Mm -hmm. And, and basically the courts have, have given tribes pretty broad deference to manage their own hunting mm -hmm. um, without <clears throat> interference from the state, mm -hmm. except for um, cases where there is a conservation issue. And that's, that, that is kind of misunderstood by a lot of people. That, so a conservation issue from the law is, it means like, the animals are going to go extinct. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's not that you can't manage, you, you won't meet a management objective unless you do a certain thing. Mm -hmm. That's not what the court means by, by a, a conservation issue. So, so anyway, they, you know, they have pretty good autonomy to manage their own um, hunting and they have their own legal code and their own biologists and mm -hmm. their own game wardens. And so the courts are pretty, differ pretty much to that. So, um, I think if it was legal under the tribal's code, uh, the tribal code, I believe that would uh, would not run afoul of um, our. I mean, they they wouldn't get ticketed by our people. Okay, so so do you think that hunters, if they feel like predators are a problem, could could approach tribal members and try to work with them to get them to harvest in areas um, more more affecting like somehow work out a system where where the the tribal members are the ones doing the harvest do you think there's some legal things where if we're trying to influence as a as a non-tribal member and and work with something that that has that capability that that would go into some muddy water and um i don't know i don't know uh, um i mean that's kind of out of the scope of what we do so okay. people can do i guess can explore whatever they Think they can explore i um uh i mean if you know then if there's a nexus that involves non-tribal state citizens in the activity then that's a problem yeah um but uh, but i don't you know yeah that's a little bit of a gray area i guess yeah okay um one person was asking if a draw only system was implemented, how do you think it would affect pressure on the west side of the state? Um, I, I think it would depend on how people perceive uh, their opportunity. Like mm -hmm. you kind of talked about. So I'm sure there are people who put in for or east side um, tags that. Mm -hmm. um, or don't think they're going to be successful that are going to hunt on the west side just because it's a, an over-the-counter uh, branch antler bull opportunity. So if people thought they had better chances uh, than they m maybe do now um, mm -hmm. to draw an east side tag, that yeah, it might move some people over here. Okay, I'm, I've also discussed making it like like a zone management. If if that became an issue, Idaho also caps zones and a first come first serve basis. So if that ever became an issue where West Side was being overcrowded because of the number, if you made it a zone management where you purchased either your tag or your application by zone and were limited to that, it would, one, make people who are focusing on hunting Yakima, Kalakam, or Blues, if they don't draw, they don't hunt, they don't have the opportunity to then go to the West Side and hunt over the counter. But people who were putting in say they don't they don't think they have a chance to draw Yakima in this system or one of the draw only units or zones. If they wanted to hunt in the meantime, build up points in a zone type system, it would be managed under that, that capping of first come first serve people. It stops at a certain number and then you're not overcrowding the West side and affecting those people who, who've never even thought about hunting the East side, but that's kind of the, the, the idea I've kind of played around with, but. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's there's definitely the east side, west side distribution of hunters has, for some people, um, certainly, you know, it has to do with their expectation of the kind of opportunity that they're going to get to hunt a bigger bull. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, so this is actually pretty interesting. You might be able to speak to this. Someone has noticed that in time in the field that they, there seems to be an increase of one by two elk in the Colocum. He wants to know if horn configuration is genetic or random and if, if it is possible if since one by twos are the bulls escaping to adulthood due to, due to the true spike regulation that their genes are creating more one by twos. Um, I think the, the preponderance of branching on yearling bull antlers, there's probably a genetic component component. There's probably also a pretty strong nutritional component. I don't think it's random. Mm -hmm. Um, and it probably varies. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if we actually had the data that, you know, that the number of, of yearling bulls that are not one by ones could be different across different populations mm -hmm. because of those um, factors. Um, you know, I've heard this, I've much more often heard, you know, the, the notion of uh, the three pointer or better mule deer hunting makes these uh, mega uh, two by twos. It will never ever be anything but a two yeah. by two. I don't think the data is very good to support that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I guess I, I'd be a little skeptical that we're modifying kind of genetic frequencies uh, with true spike and creating more uh, <laughs> one by twos or one by threes. Gotcha. Um, and the last question we've kind of touched on because it's it's kind of a, a question for another person another day. But um, basically, I, I'm that's that's about all I got. I don't know if there's anything you el you want to speak to before we kind of end this. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about. I read I read your paper on the bull in the Hanford site that you followed for seventeen year eighteen years. Um, yeah. Well. We I, when I started that work, he was probably about three. Uh -huh. um, so I, yeah, my, when I did my master's at Hanford, so that elk population is pretty good size now. And mm -hmm. in fact, it's really difficult for us to manage the numbers because mm -hmm. there's not much public ground mm -hmm. uh, available to do that. But Quick. so now it, it's, it's uh, somewhere north of 1,200 elk but when i did my masters down there there were 27 total um <laughs> and i pretty much knew by sight almost all of them certainly all the bulls i did know there mm -hmm. were only five of them and the bull that i wrote that article about was one of those guys and he was about a three or four year old then and so then um myself and some of my colleagues that i worked with Followed him through the rest of his life, which, and he ended up dying. Yeah. When he was just shy of his 18th birthday, um, just died of natural causes. So could you, could you talk about what, what he, he did as far as, uh, behavior and, cause I think people would find that, that story pretty interesting and I can post it along with, um, this, but yeah. That, so there were, there were, when I started that work, there were two, clearly the, the two old biggest bulls were uh, a bull I ended up kind of nicknaming Brutus and one that I nicknamed Melvin, which is the one you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of continued to observe those guys for a number of years, collected shed antlers from both of them. Um, Melvin, we ended up kind of creating a, a collection of a number of his sheds uh, which allowed us to kind of look at his antler growth and mass mm -hmm. uh, through kind of his age span um brutus was kind of the boss initially and um uh, he was actually killed by a hunter when he was nine he was a seven by seven then and boone and crockett scored um I think it was. I think his post deduction score was like three seventy nine. So his gross was was pretty pretty dang high up there. Yeah, I can't remember what his gross was. And then Melvin Melvin was a bull that tended to have a lot of kind of gnarly things going on on his racks from year to year. He he didn't have 
you know, he had the underlying basic structure of an adult antler scheme of kind of the six by six, but he'd always have these extra mm-hmm. kickers and points and kind of points that went off in weird angles and stuff. But yeah. um, anyway, he, he seemed to always be dom- or, uh, he was not dominant to Brutus. Brutus was always dominant to him, even though they're about the same age. Mm-hmm. Um, and Brutus and Melvin kind of continued to kind of do the, his elk thing and participate in the ruts. Um, Tilly was pretty late in life and his antlers didn't seem to regress till he got to be about 16, 15, 16. And when he died, um, they had definitely uh, regressed quite a bit, mostly the top half of his antlers. Mm-hmm. And that last couple of years of his life, he seemed to pretty much ignore the rut. He kind of just lived the life of a loner. Mm-hmm. Um, last time I saw him in the field, I think he was, it was about a year or so before he died. Um, and yeah, he was, he was, it was in the middle of the rut. He still had velvet on some of his antler. He would, had a pretty severe limp um, and was, you know, clearly in uh, kind of a decline. He had this mm-hmm. weird thing going too then that his, one of his, one of his ears drooped uh, oh, kind yeah. of hung down alongside of his face. Um, mm-hmm. And almost like you'd think he'd had a stroke or something. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I actually didn't think he'd live through that next winter or the coming winter, but he did. And it was the following winter that he actually died. Gotcha. Um, um, and what, what did he top out at? What was his, his biggest? His raw scores were pretty darn high. They were they were up in the like 440 range. That's, that's incredible. Uh, and... But, you know, he had so much weird stuff going on is that if you scored him as a typical he you get a lot of deductions but mm-hmm. if you scored him as a non-typical he had he was pretty impressive his his last few sets antlers were ginormous hunks of bone for sure that's that's interesting um and you said they topped out at 14 15 15 16 years yeah i think he started he definitely had regressed by 16 so i think somewhere around 15 16 gotcha. uh, i think was when he kind of finally started to did truncate you, the top half of his antlers. Did you ever see, this is kind of a, an interesting question, did he ever in the years from like 10 to 15 have a year where he grew larger and then smaller and then larger the next year? Or was it always no, an increase? I mean, every year that we picked up his sheds, they were always a little bit heavier. Okay. Um, his, you know, his point count would kind of bounce around a little bit again because he had so many weird, Yeah. he just had a tendency to kind of produce these extra mm-hmm. points. Gotcha. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll attach that. It's a pretty interesting read. Uh, last question about that. Did, is there is there a way that you think the Hanford area could ever be opened up? Or is it under such tight control that they, you don't think it will ever open up to, to hunt or permit? System? No, we, we, we have had a couple of runs at it. And we're actually in a conversation right now with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Energy to see um kind of what the possibilities would be the, the elk curd originally was confined to a part of the site which is was always been known as the Arid Lands Ecology Reserve which mm-hmm. is basically highway 240 um south to the top of Rattlesnake Mountain mm-hmm. um which was never an area that was used for any industrial purposes out there it was originally kind of kept as a buffer zone for the uh, cities of like Prosser, mm-hmm. um, you know, dating back to like the forties. Um, and the elk didn't really go to the other parts of the site. Well, they have now, um, and they have been doing that for a while. And so there's a growing elk presence in what we call central Hanford, which is kind of out more where a lot of the facilities are and a lot of the, you know, um, processing plants and things like that. Mm-hmm to the point where the Department of Energy has become increasingly concerned about vehicle collisions for workers going in and out of their work areas. So they have shown an interest in potentially doing something to to reduce the population. Our, our 
herd objective for that population is 350. It's at about 1,000 so, now, right? And we're, we're multiple times yeah. above that. But, um, you know, almost all the harvest we have gotten for a long time is on private land yeah. joining Hanford. And we have some hunting agreements with, with folks there that allow us to take some animals, but, you know, we can't, we, we're not taking enough to even eat up the interest on yeah. the population yeah. uh, and get to the principal, which would, is what you'd have to do to start pushing back down. Yeah. So, you know, there's complexities um, to trying to get in there because hunting has never occurred there, uh, or at least not since the 40s. But it doesn't seem it doesn't seem impossible. So I think it'll take a little while. Mm -hmm. But um, there is there is a conversation going on right now about what it would take to get some sort of hunting activity on the site. Gotcha.